Uh, hi, everyone. This is Anna Nash and Kim Nash. We are Mike Nash's parents. Everyone is asking about Michael and what happened and how we feel about this great loss for us. We were happy to do this because I don't want any other artist breaking down and losing his life for this cannibalistic industry. Michael is the youngest of our three kids. We are both migrants. To Australia. So to Australia, came in 70 and 74, and uh, came in from a sort of European Middle Eastern background. Migrants always overcompensate. Michael was born in 1985, so he's 35 years old. So he was born very premature. Yeah, and uh, I nearly died having him. He was born at 28 weeks at 1,100 grams, came down to 700. He was fully ventilated for a while, but the little bugger, he had an interarterial catheter in his umbilicus to feed him. It was very, very sick. And he had it stitched to his skin, and he put his hand there and pulled the darn thing out, he saying, I feet. don't need it. Yep. He wanted to be alive. He wanted to be existing. That boy had something to do. I knew since he was little that he had something to do. And as he grew up, um, we had lots of problems because of his prematurity. But I was an intensive pediatric care nurse, so really nobody better than me could deal with that. We brought him home you know, and nurtured him, stopping breathing more than 30 times a day. We never missed a beat, never, never needed to be hospitalized to the absolute his amazement of the amazement staff. Of the staff. The, and they know, called him the miracle golden <clears throat> boy. They never seen him until he was five or six years old. Uh, no, six months I took him back yeah. and the doctor yeah. was ready to leave that day. She was so distressed. She'd just taken a baby like his age off the ventilator, didn't do well. And she said, I can't do this. And I took Michael there and he was a smiling, beautiful, beaming six months old. Yeah. And she cried and she said, I need to stay. I said, yep, you need to stay because those kids... You never know what they will offer the world. So Michael grew up and started being, you know, looking really into painting, drawing, sculpting, doing Play-Doh. And so I thought this child needs to be nurtured. And I did art myself and it was beaten out of me because my grandfather, my grandfather, was an artist. Uh, he used to paint. So on Friday, I used to, when he was at preschool, it was our time. His brothers were at school. We did art all day. And the bond is with him is unbelievable. Like we bonded over art. And then when he was three and something, they brought in an Amiga and I saw it in a shop, in a shopping center, and my heart stopped. And I thought, my God, the graphics are amazing amazing so I took Michael and I said do you like that and his mouth was open he said yes mummy and it was eleven hundred dollars it was more than a month's wages we didn't have much money I went in and bought it we got a, a little software called the talking coloring book yep. and he used to sit in my lap on a computer use the mouse there was no other computer then that had a mouse that was the only pull down menus and stuff so mm. a little child can use it because everything was DOS based. Michael just fell in love with this computer and that's how he started his career. And he was just, he was, you could see the talent and we just moved on with other computers and, you know, that was his love. He, he wouldn't even socialize. He at, at, at 14, a German company wanted him to do a hand for some project they were doing. They did not want a human hand, and they did not know how old he is. He put, he, it took him 20 minutes, he created the hand, and then they, he charged them 600 American dollars for 20 minutes' work, and they did not know 
who that person was or how old he was then. From so that, when he wanted to drop out of school, I said to him, if you really want to make it big, you need a degree. And he said, Mum, they can't teach this stuff. No. Mum, there is no books yet. And I knew that. He was very right-brained. And artists um, are right-brained. I did a course call, called Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain where you switch. So this boy was born with a very big right brain and that's why he was able to do spatial, everything was in his head. So, you know, Sia Mac, at 14 or 15, he said, Mum, I'm working, I'm testing some hair software for somebody. Can you get me some hairdressing cutting magazines, you know, to cut hair? I said, okay, why? He said, because I need to do the hair, hair by hair, and have it cut like a hairdresser would cut it. So when the model runs or something, it has to sit right. And then he said to me, Mum, I need some um, decent anatomy books. You've got anatomy books? I said, yeah. I gave him Gray's Anatomy, and he said, I need something better even. So I went and got him a $130 book for doctors, you know. And he showed me what he did with it. In his modeling, he can go with the sinew and with every blood vessel. And do you know what it reminded me? I read at the age of 12 or 13, Michael Angelos, and he was called Michael, and I didn't even call him after Michael Angelos. He was called Michael after Prof, Prof Michael who delivered him. But... He is the Michelangelo of the graphic art because Michelangelo used to, it was illegal to uh, dissect bodies and he wanted to do the greatest art that he could get and he wanted to know what is inside the skin. So Michelangelo, I don't know if you know the story, but he used to dissect, it used, they used to kill them if they did that in the Middle Ages, to go to the mortuary and the Pope allowed it. And he used to dissect to see, to do every sinew, every muscle, every blood vessel. My son initially was headhunted by Pandemic Studios. So he was mollycoddled, really. He was treated, you know, Bono was uh, the owner at the time. It was pre-2008, you know, the economic collapse was a disaster for the industry. He had an amazing workspace. He went to work at 10 o'clock whenever he felt like it after the gym. He worked till 7, 8. Work was flexible when he needed to. They had iris uh, stuff. They had technology well advanced. Um, and so he thought that was his first work because he was freelancing from home. So he never worked for anyone. So Michael thought that's how he'll be treated. He's gifted. He'll do the work 150%, not just that. Then the economic collapse happened and he lost his job. And when he lost his job, he was headhunted, he and a couple of other talented guys from Pandemic by, I think, I can't remember, mm. it's Liquid Crystal or something company. like that, yeah. some company. And they put him right in the corner and they timed him and he had to turn up on time. And he saw what the other ask kisses, excuse my language, did. They came on time, went on time, produced very little. Nine to five. Kissed yeah. us and talked about their weekend all, all day and they got away with it. Michael wanted to come in at 10 and work his ass off and he did. Basically talked to him and he said, I can't do this, mum, I can't. I'm producing all the work. They're taking the accolade and I can't deal with it. I said, well, quit if quit. So he basically quit and started on his own. But the problem with the industry is you are always as good as your last project and you cannot just be static. You know, I'm, I worked in medical research for many, many years. I've got research background for the last 20 years of my life. And there is a saying called publish or perish. And I'm sure it's huge in your industry too. And so he used to say to me, Mum, I'm in between jobs, but I can't rest. I, I really need to do a project. Otherwise, I would not be out there. 
And this is one of the aspects that we think the industry cannibalizes these artists. They feel that they could get better and better and better and better. And cheaper. And another thing is with COVID, with COVID and the globalization as it is before, you know, you worked in a studio and you worked under art directors and all that kind of stuff. And they, they hunted you around the place or brought you in. Now they just basically can get anybody. They can get a kid from Egypt, for example, for $50 a day. He told me he was sponsoring, he was mentoring this kid for free because the kid couldn't, you know. He landed himself a job in China on, on one of those projects. And this, maybe that person will hear it and know himself. This young, beautiful man, his granddad died, his grandma died in Egypt, and they would not let him leave to attend her funeral. And he was getting $50 a week. And that's why Michael put that out. How much, you know, are you worth, you know? And he was saying to me, Mum, there'll be somebody else quoting 200 a day for 12 hours work. I can't do that. I have a huge rent. Everything is expensive in Australia and it got worse with COVID. And I really hope no one else suffers what Michael has suffered. The industry wants more. They still sell their games for quite a lot of money. They're making huge amounts. Michael's job, he had a job that he quoted for. He was so anxious about, he had to sign a contract and it was time framed. And if actually he didn't produce by the time, he will be fined. Okay. He had to get a lawyer look at it. He was so anxious. He told me, mum, I'm really losing sleep over this job. I want it, but I don't want it at the same time. I have to have it because I need work. And I said to him, don't take it if it's really making you. So he actually removed that time close with so much doing and throwing. A million and one emails had to go dealing with these kind of people. And I'm not going to just say who they are, but they affected Michael. That was another straw that Mike, that broke Michael's back. Then they had two art directors, you know, with lots of egos. He had to do a complete redoing of the project, a complete redo for the same money. I think he let that job go after spending a lot of time on it. Is that how they wanted the industry want to treat the artists as slaves because this is slavery. You cannot enslave an artist. Michelangelo was enslaved and was forced by the Pope to work on that Sistine Chapel. And I did go to Italy and I sat there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To see the suffering of artists to produce their work. Lying on his back at the height of... Uh... 15 meter ceiling, you know, and painting, creating. I don't know how he did it, but yeah, he suffered doing and, it, I'm sure. And you know, what was in that room was amazing. And they made us move on. And I had to yell at the officer, I said, This is my lifetime thing I dreamt of being with the greatness of the greatest artist on earth. You don't you dare talk to me like this. I will move when I want to. So now I hope Michael's work will stay for others. We want everyone to help us keep his work up. We will be bringing his computers home. And if there is something on his computer to be released <laughs> to the world, we, we will. We will. We, we have no idea. I have no idea um, uh, what is the word for co computer illiterate, whatever, but we're going to try. Kim is really not into computers. <clears throat> I'm the one that introduced Michael and I feel I've sacrificed him on that altar. <laughs> so I want his work to live forever. That was Batman Returns when he worked. He was headhunter to work on Batman Returns. The, that, Atlas. Yeah, that's, that is Michael when he was, that's him. And he did the 3D. On the printer. Of, of himself, yeah. And as you could see, I, I look at the musculature. This is all 
Grey's Anatomy. You know, I just want to tell you something. At about 17, Michael gained a lot of weight. He was 100 kilos. You might, hard to believe. So I had to talk to him and I said, Michael, please get out and start. You know, you're just shuffling now and you're becoming overweight. Please, please. You know, your self-esteem would be no good, you know. You're gaining weight. I, I'm not criticizing. I'm just worried about you. He snapped out of it and that boy went over the top. He became an, like a, a, book for a Greek god. The boy had discipline. If someone says it can't be done, I will kill myself to prove. And he's got that. He's got that. I had to build, build him a gym in his room. He would never leave his bedroom. He had uh, weight lifting equipment. He had all the machinery for bodybuilding. He bought a book about Arnold Schwarzenegger. He had it on, on the window. It was his hero. And uh, It was his hero. Michael, basically, that's what made him good in his craft. Everything had to be done to perfection, to the best of his ability, and he never, he never ever accepted that that was the level you get. That's what maybe created that anxiety in him and he just couldn't deal with it. And maybe we will talk about what happened and I really feel we need to share it. Yeah, he lost a lot of money, as you know. He, he had Bitcoin, he, he liquidated it a bit early according to him and then he felt that he needed to make up the money and he basically put a lot of money out there that Bitcoin goes up and the only time that Bitcoin did not go up when until it hit that ceiling of 40. It's the only time and he actually lost 1 to 10. So he lost a hell lot of money and he called me and he said, I'm not good for anything I failed. I failed relationship. I failed you. I cannot, I can't, I can't make money. I can't even make a decision. I'm no good. I really need to go. And he wanted to throw himself from the balcony. And I said, hang on here, back off. And I was like working and I had like, thank God I had one of my consults actually cancel on me. So he, um, he was sort of, I am, I am no good. I don't deserve to live. And, you know, it was unbelievable. I'm saying, my God, you, you are so special. Go back, go back. And I said, look, you know, if you hit the ground, you might be a quadriplegic. You might not get out of this and it will be even worse for you and us. Please. And I rang his brother, Christopher, thank God, he, he picked up and I rang the ambulance and the, triple zero and they all came and yeah, Christopher yeah, talked to yeah, him, yeah. talked to him. And why this happened, because I am in Perth, which is six hours by flight away from Queensland, from Brisbane, where he lives. I've let him go because I've loved him. They say, if you love something, you let it free. I let him go because that's where the opportunity was. It broke my heart letting him go, that we're not there for him. So that's what happened and, and they, they got in and the doctor released him and said to me, he's, a, he's all right, it's just he lost money, he's not really depressed and I said he's extremely anxious and he's not dealing with things. He's a great artist and artists are very sensitive souls. Please, you know, you need to have him there, look after him until we do something. No, 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 we're releasing him uh, in the care of his friend. And that was it. Sister, and we'll Sister, follow not... we'll follow him up. And it was a phone call follow-up. And this is another thing, as you saw, you know, CMAC, you've been on my on my website and stuff. You know, this medicine by remote doesn't work. You can't examine people, you can't see them. It wasn't, a, a, I don't think it was over Skype or Zoom or whatever. She spoke to him on a phone. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, when, when I, I watched that one that you sent me on the, I think in end of November, Michael was extremely anxious. His body, I know my son, his body language was not looking on the camera he, he he dropped the ball a few times. 
that's not my Michael. He was very fidgety, touching his beard, his face a lot. Very, very, he really was unstable. He was quite anxious. Anxious. Very irritated, too, whatever. Yeah. So <clears throat> they let him. They failed him. And then another one, Marcos, you know, Marcos, you will know yourself, you will see this. Sweet Marcos messaged me a few weeks after they put him on some Prozac or some crap. Uh, he, and, Michael uh, told me SSRI. That is it. It's, it's called serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So uh, it's a group of drugs. They're very dangerous. I don't agree with them. He did not have depression. He had anxiety. He messaged Michael, said, oh, I've taken some medications or whatever, and I want to finish it. I can't deal with this anxiety, Marcos. I can't deal with the anxiety. It was the anxiety. It's not the depression. It was continuous anxiety. He knew what he had, but he yeah. could not control it. Uh, Marcos messages me, and I don't really look at my phone on Saturday, Sunday. I try to have a bit of a break. But that morning I looked at his message and said, are you Michael, Mike Nash's mum? I need to ring triple zero. He's threatening to do something. You know, he can't deal with his anxiety. So I said, keep him talking. And I rang the mob and they treated me badly because I was trying to explain to them. And she's saying, you're raising your voice. And uh, the whole system thinks they managed to go looking for him and, his friend helped them and whatever, and Marcos kept talking to him. Bless you, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. You gave him to us a bit longer, although, you, you know, just talking to him on the phone. Uh, he was inside the house. He was just, he was not a person that could kill himself. So he always reached out, help me, I can't deal with my pain. He stayed with, yeah, he was always reaching out. I was talking hours with him. And, and he was staying with friends, so I was assured that they were, he was with someone. He could not be in the apartment, too many memories, could not be on his own, and that's part of the anxiety syndrome. When doctor shopping, I asked him, go and see a doctor with, to, to get anxiety. So this girl that he knows, she gave him a Valium. I said, no way, no Valium, do not take it anymore. They're very short-term and it highly, highly addictive, We, you know. And they won't give them to you and you'll have another thing to deal with. So please, please go and ask for some anti-anxiety until you can get to us. And they assured me that they will stay with him in the house at night. That's why I did not pack up and go because we need to get permission here. And they assured me that they're going to stay with him. Now, the, we, we managed to get the coronial inquest done very fast, I begged. I stayed on the phone the last few days despite my despair and talking to people in the press because I have put something out there saying that this lockdown that we have, which is over the top, we have to get permission to leave our country. We are in a big jail in Australia. For nine months in Western Australia, there was no community infection. Nine months. Western Australia is open, it's on level five, but they have been bringing people in, they haven't been testing, and people have got COVID and we have to deal with them in quarantine. So the actual problem is the quarantine, people, the staff getting infected and going into the community and spreading it. That's all. Now, there was an outbreak in Brisbane. That's what happened before Michael, you know, came, you know. There was outbreaks in South Australia. Michael wanted to come for Christmas. He bought a ticket and showed it to me and we were excited. A week before Christmas, he messages me because what happened, there was a South Australia outbreak and what happened, our premier, who is like the president in our state, just for others to understand, actually decided that COVID would not attack people that and it's not going to be carried by people, I'm just doing a literal thing, that we're going to arrive before midnight that day, but after midnight that day, they will go into forced quarantine and pay for their quarantine, over $3,000 for the two week, be locked up in a tiny little room with no air. 
okay? Just air conditioning. And be given the crap fruit, you know, that's microwaved or whatever, and everyone knows how Michael is about food. No vegetables, no nothing, and you cannot, you cannot order anything that's included your food, including, and you're not allowed to go out at all. Put your head out. You are in a little jail cell with even prisoners that are actually in uh, isolation that have committed so much, they, le- they let them out for an hour. These people here are not let out for 14 days, right? And if they test positive, even if they're asymptomatic, even the PCR test might not be correct, they have to stay another 14 days, okay? So Michael, with his mental state, flipped and cancelled and said, if they put me in this little jail cell, mum, I will kill myself. So I don't want to kill myself, so I'm not coming. I'll come later when I'm feeling better, okay? I cannot take this. I can't take this COVID crap. So then uh, just a week, uh, two weeks before, one of the cleaners got this COVID and went shopping, did this and gave it to her husband. They shut down the state of Queensland for three days and tested thousands of people. And not one case other than her and her husband has been found in the whole of Queensland. But our premier here, our jailer, decided that he's going to lock up and people like Michael to come and see us in his time of despair will have to maybe wait six weeks, ten weeks to be allowed in. And then they have to quarantine in a house on their own. They can't be with their family, okay? No exemption whatsoever. And I said to Michael, Michael, ask, you've got an appointment with a psychiatrist? He said, yeah. I said, ask her to give you a piece of paper saying, you really need to be home. You need to be prioritised. We will isolate you, but at least we'll be on the phone forever. And he will be like in a place very close to us. We, we have somewhere else, right? And he rang me on Friday and he was very calm. And I said to him, how did you go, mum? It's called the G2G form. And he said, I've, I'm putting the stuff in. Can you give me the address for the country property? I said, yes, okay. And uh, I sent it to him and I was talking to him. I was setting up a machine to treat someone for cancer and stuff. And uh, I said, just, I've got to sort out the software and I don't want to blow the plasma tube and stuff. Can I talk to you? And I'll, uh, you know, just keep talking and I, I, yeah, I need to concentrate on the software and whatever. So um, he was talking and I said, so what happened with the psychiatrist? He said, oh, she said, oh, look, I can't, I don't know how to do it. Just, I can't give you a thing. I said, and you just let her go. He said, she just, she just didn't care. Mm-hmm. And I said, we need that piece of paper to be prioritised. Please call the other doctor that puts you on the other antidepressant because he's gone to a few doctors since. And go to the doctor that gave you the five lots of anti-anxiety because they were worried about him overtaking stuff. And uh, he seems to be a nice man and very understanding. Ask him for a piece of paper saying that you really need your family. And I left him doing that issue and I said, give him a call with that G2G. That he said, they got back to me last time very quickly, mum, so they must be okay. They're not that busy. I said, well, that's even great. And I'll try to push here. So, and we were talking about other stuff and have you packed? And he said, I've got a quote and Jess's mum is going to come and blah, blah. And I said, okay, please. He said, I'm there. I said, please don't spend any time on your own. Please trust me. He said, oh, I'll go to the unit and check. I said, fine. But please, you know, please, please, because, you know, I don't want you on your own. So he was in really good mood. I love you. I love you, mum. And that was the end of the conversation. And we spoke to about an hour and something. He wanted to hand out. I said, look, I've set the machine. It's firing. Don't worry. We'll talk as if something like, you know, possessed me to keep talking to him. And he said, oh, I better hang up, Mum, because they'll finish their two hours ahead of us in Melbourne. They'll be knocking off. I need to talk to them. And he was really fine. 
And I tried calling him. He didn't answer. I thought he's going out with on the town with the boys because he promised that he's going to go and socialise. Sunday I called, I called, no answer. And we're here working our asses off trying to get place for him, emptying cupboards and getting a space for him so he can come and stay with us, right? So Sunday and Monday I was, yeah, working. I thought he sounded all right maybe because he's socialising with friends. He told me he wasn't going to be on his own. And I did not ring anybody else of his friends. I don't really know his friends. He did call a guy and he asked him to come over on Sunday night. And the guy said, no, uh, you come over, you know, uh, the stupidity of youth, you know, you know what I mean. And that person should have known better because he knew about should have went to see. the first attempt. But yeah. people that don't have mental illness and they're not adults, proper adults, don't know this stuff, you know. So, and I trusted an adult lady to go and stay with him. And I said, please, she said, oh, I'm his, I'm his, I'm going to be his mum in Queensland until I'll hand them to you. And I have been a mum to a boy, Turkish boy here. And he is still my boy. And I looked after him for his mum, you know, and went to his wedding and, and, and given him, him to her in one piece. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just destiny and and people not caring I don't know whatever I am really past the anger and the blame but who gave him those uh he the coroner's result was uh toxic levels of a beta blocker called propranolol propranolol is a blood pressure medication it's never ever given for someone who's suicidal never no doctor the bottle didn't have anything on it. It was worn out and old and there is no name on it. In Australia, you cannot get drugs over the counter, not those drugs. Panadol, not even Panadine. That even NSAIDs are going to be banned over the counter. So we are extremely one of the strictest countries on earth. He got that from someone. He has looked up. And it actually treats anxiety, but it has got a very long life in your liver. And I think that boy, when he spoke to me, he was very calm. I think he was self-medicating. And because he just want, did not want to get that feeling, he just kept taking it. Didn't realize that it will build up in his liver enough to shut down his heart because I will tell you that he was not found in bed. He did not leave a message. He, the times that he want, he didn't call anyone, which he did all the time, ha asking for help. He did not want to end it. For everyone out there, it must have been unconscious. It was an unconscious attempt of just quelling his pain. You know. His pain with anxiety. I experienced anxiety as a young person. I've never experienced it again. I know it will never kill me, so I conquered it. And I said that to him. But he didn't have anyone there who could help him, and it's sad. So he medicated, and I think what happened, it slowed his heart down. He could not even call anyone. I saw him falling in a black dark well I'm pretty I'm a psychic person I see dead people I see also I haven't seen my son yet but his father saw him crumpled on the floor the police officer said he must have taken his life and we thought assumed that he was in bed but then I rang Kim said to me Anna I have seen Michael on the floor crumpled up I've seen him okay and I said I have I felt that he fell into a dark, deep well and he couldn't get out of it, okay? That's how I felt his death was. So it was not a planned, but his despair and anxiety with work and COVID, the system failing him in every way and me not going there, I feel very, very guilty. I should have not trusted anyone. 
But there was the lockdown. You, you, you need yeah. to stay for two weeks away from I don't you. care. No, I wouldn't have to. I, I could be with him, but here we would have been together. But it doesn't matter. It's too late now. I can't cry over spilt milk. The crystal is shattered and, and all, uh, all the world can't put it together. Okay. It's shattered. The crystal is shattered into a million, million pieces. And we are shattered with it into a million, a million pieces. And that's why I say everybody has got a little bit in breaking down, Michael. Every, the system, the industry, his work and his obsessiveness with perfection, right, uh, has done that. I don't know anymore what to say. <laughs> <laughs>